So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Hollister. I'm a park ranger at Minuteman National Historical Park, and I'm here with historian and author Alex Kane uh, to talk about the events of April 19th, 1775, as experienced by the people of Lexington. It was this community uh, that felt the shock uh, of war that morning. Uh, it was here that the first shots were fired, and it was this community that suffered the first men killed and wounded. Um, so I just might as well just jump in uh, with the questions. So Alex, tell us a little bit about the town of Lexington and its people. For example, like, you know, how large a town was it? Uh, what sort of trades and occupations mm -hmm. were represented? In 1775, uh, Lexington was a relatively small community. Um, there was only about 750 people who resided in the community, which were composed of only about 100 families uh, during that time. Mm. Um, interesting, they also had 400 cows. Uh, <laughs> they were predominantly an uh, agricultural community. Uh, yeah. They focused in dairy products as well as mixed husbandry. Uh, there were a few individuals uh, who had second trades, uh, most notably clock making. Oh. Uh, the, the Mulligan family and the Parker family uh, were known for some of their uh, uh, clockwork uh, in 1775 through the end of the war. And then there was a smattering of blacksmiths, uh, carpenters, um, wheelwrights, and a few others. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, it was a very small, close-knit, and poor uh, dairy town. Oh, interesting. Um, so, like, in terms of its politics, um, you know, how warm was Whig or Patriot sentiment in the town? Uh, and were there any loyalists? That's a great question. And you actually have to go back to before the revolutionary crisis started with the arrival of the Reverend Jonas Clark. Mm -hmm. uh, the Reverend Jonas Clark was not only the spiritual and religious leader of the community, he was also the political leader of the town as well. And interesting, as the crisis continued to grow and worsen in the 1760s, it was actually Jonas uh, Clark uh, that was not only drafting the town's responses and the town's resolution, but he was actually pr uh, proofreading and rewriting uh, the uh, town's committee of correspondence communications to Boston, uh, oh, wow. as well as the rest of the colony. So it started with uh, the Reverend Jonas uh, Clark. In Lexington, uh, at first, when you started with the Stamp Act crisis, Lexington sort of took a moderate approach. On the one hand, they were horrified by the mob violence of Boston uh, and Salem. But on the other hand, they were somewhat troubled by the direction the British government was going. Mm -hmm. uh, so they took a tempered approach during the Stamp Act crisis, more emphasizing boycotts than violence. Uh, you started to see a change by the time of the Townsend duties coming out in the 1768, uh, where there was more of a, a more radical response, uh, where you start seeing the Reverend Clark and the town drafting resolutions stating, uh, as early as 1768, we will defend our English liberties and our English constitutional rights within all lawful bounds necessary. Wow. Uh, so they weren't outright coming out with um, rebellion. Um, but they were doing a little bit of saber rattling as early as 1768. And it continued. In 1769, uh, Lexington was heavily involved in the spinning bee protests that were throughout the uh, colony of uh, Massachusetts. Uh, they were horrified by the Boston Massacre. And then, interesting enough, uh, Lexington actually uh, protested tea as well where Boston uh, dumped their tea uh, in uh, December of 1773, the town of Lexington actually three days prior to the Boston Tea Party held a town meeting protesting um, uh, British policy and then proceeded to burn the tea in town. So they were actually ahead of Bostonians. Um, so the town was actually a very big hotbed. And as I indicated, the Reverend Jonas Clark was part of this. He was actually recruited by other towns, Lincoln, Concord, Bedford, as far north as Andover, Massachusetts, to come and speak to their congregations. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you have uh, Lord Hugh Earl Percy referencing uh, the black regiment that was spewing sedition from the pulpit, uh, it was actually Lexington's Jonas Clark that was leading this charge. Um, what's interesting when you ask about loyalists, as yeah. far as my research has seen, Lexington doesn't have any loyalists. Um, there is local tradition that members of the uh, Loring family might mm -hmm. have been members of the uh, of uh, who are loyal to the crown and fled. 
but I haven't been able to document uh, anything. And I think this is attributable back to the Reverend Jonas Clark. As said, by 1765, he has a very, very tight grip on his community and is the one who's dictating politics during the time. Interesting. When did he come to the pulpit? He arrived about 1757, 1758. Interesting enough, the predecessor was a Reverend uh, Hancock, uh, mm. who was a cousin of John Hancock, uh, the, uh, the famous uh, uh, patriot uh, from Massachusetts. Uh, he arrived in Lexington about 1698, 1700. Interesting. Oh, I was just thinking because in, in Concord, uh, they had uh, the Reverend William Emerson, who was a yes. warm patriot. Um, yes. He came to the pulpit in Concord in 1765. So just as this is starting, and right. um, you don't see Concord really building up until the 1770s. Um, and you see that in a lot of the communities where you have the ministers who are just recently arriving. Uh, Newburyport is a perfect example uh, of that, where you had some uh, ministers, um, a uh, Reverend uh, Curry uh, didn't arrive until about 1770. And again, mm -hmm. Newburyport was actually during the uh, Tea Party crisis was criticized for taking no position uh, on the uh, on the tea issue. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Similar with Andover. Andover, uh, their ministers uh, didn't arrive until about the same time Reverend Emerson. And again, they were slow uh, to the uh, uh, to the game. But the Reverend Clark was there since the 1750s, and he made himself. Uh, well entrenched uh, within it. And it also, uh, there's documentation from the uh, Reverend Clark's own diary, how political leaders were constantly going to him for advice, for consultation. Mm -hmm. So he, he simply um, took that leading role within the community. Oh, that's, yeah, that's great. So, you know, when we get to early spring 1775, um, I mean, Lexington must have been a town on edge, as was yes. most of the province. Um, so what do you see in terms of, you know, what were they doing to prepare uh, for this very possible conflict, you know, the very real possibility of conflict? Yeah, you actually have to go back to October of 1774. Um, Lexington uh, was already, well, actually, you have to go earlier than that. Uh, 1768, the Reverend Clark was actually preaching from the pulpit of how it would be considered sinful if you were not military prepared for a conflict. Hmm. Uh, and that was a sermon he gave in Boston. Uh, so you can imagine to the um, ancient honorable artillery company. Yep. So you can imagine what he's saying in the pulpit back in Lexington. Um, in 1774, Reverend Clark notes as early as September of 1774, uh, the Lexington training band is drilling uh, on the uh, green. Uh, you have the resolutions from the Massachusetts Provincial Congress in late October 1774, uh, where there's a general belief war is coming. And mm -hmm. as a result, Provincial Congress orders the various towns to start preparing for the possibility of war. By early November of 1774, Lexington is already ramping up uh, its uh, military preparedness. One of the very first things uh, that was done, which surprised me, it wasn't really known until about two years ago when it was discovered in town records, is Lexington purchased a pair of iron cannons uh, from the town of Watertown. Oh, wow. Uh, according to, uh, I spoke to John Bell about this, and John believes that these may have been old coastal defense guns mm -hmm. from either Boston or perhaps one of the other uh, waterfront communities. The guns ended up being moved to Watertown, where Lexington went in and purchased the guns. Um, they were then brought to Jonas Parker, uh, who was killed at the Battle of Lexington. Jonas Parker was a carpenter, mm -hmm. and so as a result, he was making carriages for the guns. Meanwhile, the town of Lexington actually then continued to start taking a step. Bayonets that had been issued to the town during the French and Indian War to be turned in and then redistributed to certain members of the uh, community. They then, um, from there, they also were acquiring a pair of drums. Mm -hmm. uh, they were also had inspections in December of 1774 to see what uh, they were actually uh, ready for, what uh, arms and equipment they had, and what arms and equipment they were deficient in. Uh, so as a result, when they realized that there were these deficiencies, uh, it became a community effort. And as a result, various individuals from the community got together and started making uh, various equipment for the militiamen in Lexington. Mm -hmm. 
Jonathan Harrington Sr., uh, who's the father of the company Pfeiffer, Jonathan Harrington, uh, was actually making cartridge boxes and belting uh, for the Lexington Militia. Wow. Uh, Philip Russell, uh, who's another resident, was also making cartridge boxes, and because he was a blacksmith, was making bayonets for members of the militia. Uh, Jonas Parker, who I just referenced, the uh, town um, carpenter, um, most of the Lexington militia is believed were carrying Fowlers, uh, not military-issued weapons, but civilian guns. Yep. Jonas Parker, according to his estate um, uh, records, he was actually taking those fowlers because the wood is stocked to the end of the muzzle right. of a barrel. He was cutting back the gun stocks uh, so that they could accept socket bayonets being made by Philip Russell. Um, Nathan Simons uh, was providing blankets to those Lexington militiamen who could not afford them. Uh, the interesting, another one we just uh, stumbled across was Jeremiah Harrington. Uh, Jeremiah Harrington acquired uh, close to a dozen yards of tow cloth and was making knapsacks for companies of the militia. And then finally, uh, John Parker, um, who was the uh, militia captain, uh, we believe he was making powder horns uh, for the Lexington company. And it's interesting, in the aftermath of the Battle of uh, Lexington, um, many of the dead and wounded on the green were looted by British, by British soldiers. Now, they weren't taking personal belongings like money or watches or anything. They were removing military equipment, uh, probably more of a policing action so it wouldn't end up back in the hands of the militia company mm -hmm. they just defeated. And the most common item being recovered, uh, the three most common items were bayonets, cartridge boxes, and powder horns. Um, the other two individuals are Joshua Reed and the unidentified gentleman only known as Ensign Harrington hmm. were actually going to different communities buying gunpowder and lead uh, for the uh, community. Um, it ended up they went to Waltham uh, where they ended up purchasing 104 pounds of bullets uh, for, uh, for the Lexington militia. And then they went to Boston twice uh, to bring up uh, lead. Uh, a Joshua Reed, who was another Lexington resident, he was actually making um, um, cartridges for the two iron cannons uh, that were purchased. Um, I should state, however, the cannons were not ready uh, in time for April 19th. Mm -hmm. And as far as we know, they were never brought uh, into uh, action. The other thing that uh, Lexington uh, was done up to the night before the Battle of Lexington, April 18th, the town was constantly drilling. Mm -hmm. uh, Reverend Jonas Clark, as well as Lieutenant William Tidd, in a deposition from the early 19th century, indicate that the company was constantly, constantly meeting to drill. Uh, so this was a company that was probably well-armed, uh, well-drilled, uh, and was uh, sufficiently, in theory, you would think, prepared in the event uh, war would happen. Of course, what happened on April 19th showed as much as you're prepared, hopefully prepared, mm -hmm. you truly aren't for what happens. Well, I mean, nobody could really expect what actually happened. Exactly, exactly. You know, but it's interesting with all these preparations, um, and, you know, I mean, they're acquiring bayonets and making cartridge pouches and powder horns, um, cutting down the stalks of fowling pieces to accept bayonets. I mean, it sounds like they're really forward and also, you know, calling out the militia to train. Um, constantly. And yet, you know, we hear a lot about the Lexington Minutemen, but the town didn't form a minute company. That, that's the great mystery. And I have to give background for that is at some point in the early 20th century, and I'll be nice here, some jerk uh, <laughs> walked into Lexington Town Hall and stole the uh, official town records from 1775. Ooh. Uh, I have seen the transcripts of Lexington town records. They end about January of 1775, and they're gone up until about January of 1776. So there's a whole oh. year missing. So part of the mystery is whether or not Lexington created a minute company. On the one hand, there's limited evidence that they were at least taking steps towards forming a minute company. I mean, it sounds like they're functioning as a minute company. They, they, exactly, exactly. And the, the, the hints are come go to bayonets. Uh, when they created this order that turn in all the bayonets and they were going out to buy additional bayonets, they were actually hoping um, to give it to a third of the company, which is consistent with what you would see with other minute companies. Mm -hmm. The problem is that's the only real reference we see to a minute company. There is a reference in 1776 uh, to one of the family members um, whose husband was killed at the Battle of Lexington, 
and in the petition to the provincial congress for compensation for items stolen or looted by the British soldiers on the Battle of Lexington, um, there was um, a reference. He was referred to as a Minuteman, mm -hmm. but it's the legislature, not the family that's petitioning. So th there's no direct evidence. So the question becomes, first, why wasn't there a, a Minuteman company? Mm -hmm. And secondly, what was actually the company known at the Battle of uh, Lexington? There's one or two reasons why uh, you can point a finger why a Minuteman company was not created. Mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, you could put a point a finger at Thomas Gardner. Uh, Thomas Gardner at the time was the colonel of the 1st Middlesex Regiment. In the 18th century, every town was required to have a militia company. And every county would have at least one regiment composed of those town militia companies. Mm -hmm. By 1775, there was probably about six or seven uh, regiments in the county of Middlesex because they were so big, and the militia companies were broken up, broken up into district regiments. It's believed most likely Lexington belonged to the 1st Middlesex Regiment, which was composed of Lexington, Cambridge, um, uh, Natick, and, and Charlestown, and other communities. There's no order that I can see from Thomas Gardner that went out to form minute companies. Mm -hmm. uh, now, granted, the Massachusetts Provincial Congress issued the orders to the towns saying form your minute companies. Uh, but because some of the towns were slow, many regimental uh, colonels uh, would actually go out to the various communities and encourage their men, uh, their, the men in their companies to form those minute companies. Uh, Samuel Johnson of the 4th Essex Regiment uh, up here in the Merrimack Valley actually went uh, to all his uh, towns and really, really pushed them saying, you need to form minute companies, let's form them right now. Mm -hmm. And usually either between instantaneously to within 48 hours, uh, minute companies started popping up in the Merrimack Valley after he visited. It doesn't appear that Thomas Gardner uh, actually uh, did that. Uh, so as a result, um, uh, Lexington didn't act on it. Uh, the, the second reason was I think some towns, uh, I think, were slow to move because either they were focused on trying to equip the men that they had, mm -hmm. train the men they have, or just simply trying to find the necessary resources. Uh, as Lexington is scrambling to make these various goods, other communities are facing the same things. So that goes to the question then, if Lexington, uh, what were they known as? Formally, if you look at the town records when they were mm -hmm. voting to fund, they were known as the Lexington tra Training Band. The Lexington Training Band was their formal, uh, almost Puritan-like name from the 17th century. Many right. militia companies in, in Massachusetts and New England were called training bands. But if you take a look at the depositions and the accounts of the men, they mm -hmm. informally refer to the company as Captain John Parker's company. Uh, so it'd be correct either to say they were known as the Lexington Training Band or Captain John Parker's company. But as of right now, there is no evidence that a Lexington Minute Company existed on April 19th, 1775. Yeah, interesting, because the Provincial Congress, of course, you know, somewhat uncertain of its authority is making recommendations. Exactly. <clears throat> and that, that, that was the big thing. The Provincial Congress, it, it, it wasn't an order. It was a recommendation. And a lot of what they did was recommendation. And I think the reason why they did that was if they issued an order, they suddenly became uh, this uh, rebellious legislative body. Uh, where before they were sort of trying to present themselves as, hey, we're the people who are sort of looking out and trying to protect uh, our colony's constitutional mm -hmm. rights, and we're advising our towns to do these various things. Um, but you're absolutely right. At that stage in October of 74, I think the language was purposely chosen for recommendation to avoid any appearance or accusation of uh, rebellion. Right, yeah. And so, you know, some regiments you know, take the recommendation, some towns, some right. don't. Sounds like Gardner didn't. Yeah. Now, speaking of militia laws and militia structures, so, the, you know, the laws um, specifically um, prohibit um, Indians and Negroes from serving in yes. uh, the militia companies and the training bands. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, of course, servants for life, enslaved people. And so, mm -hmm. on one of the men on the town, Green, Prince Esterbrook, who was an enslaved black man. So, how did he come to be there? Um, it, it's interesting because we, we recently have found out there may have been two to, two to five more black men uh, on the green with Prince Esterbrook. Uh, there was Palm Blackman, uh, Jupiter Tree, uh, Prince Esterbrook, and I believe there might have been two other individuals. And it does raise the question, you know, given these existence of the militia laws, how did they end up on the green, uh, fully armed and equipped uh, in violation of the laws? 
and I think it was it was two reasons. Um, Prince Estabrook um, was an enslaved person uh, at the time of uh, the Battle of Lexington. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was considered uh, the property, sadly, of uh, Joseph Estabrook. Uh, so um, they're interesting. Um, there is uh, some hints. It, you could, under Massachusetts laws, uh, or at least under practice, I should say, you could find a substitute to mm-hmm. serve uh, in your place uh, in the militia. And although uh, Indians and Negroes were considered uh, excluded from that substitution, Mm -hmm. many militia captains and many jurisdictions sort of turned a blind eye away from if an enslaved person was uh, serving. Mm -hmm. Um, So as a result, uh, there is uh, uh, indirect evidence that Estabrook never fought. uh, And and I mean, Joseph Estabrook, the owner, never fought on April 19th, 1775. Mm -hmm. Uh, And in fact, may have assisted um, a family member who was pregnant Mm -hmm. being removed uh, from uh, from the vicinity of the fighting. And Prince went in his place. Um, As for Jupiter Tree um, and uh, uh, Blackman, um, the the belief is uh, similar, that they may have substituted uh, for another uh, member of the Lexington community, mm-hmm. um, or um, simply Lexington. The other theory, which which sort of falls more into local tradition, which maybe perhaps um, just to probably sort of smooth over the ugliness of human ownership of the time, is that uh, members of the Lexington community simply turned a blind eye that this person may be enslaved, but we're going to let them feel with the militia. Is there evidence that they trained with the militia company? Yes, yes, there oh. is. There, there is evidence that they trained with the militia company. Um, there uh, is evidence after the battles of Lexington uh, in Concord that they actually continued to serve not only with the militia company, but uh, served with uh, Captain M- uh, Edmund Monroe's company of the 15th Massachusetts mm-hmm. uh, from 1777 up until 1780. Um, and I should say all of them, with the exception of Prince Esterbrook, Prince Esterbrook ultimately ended up in the uh, 3rd Massachusetts Regiment, Colonel mm-hmm. Drayton's regiment. And he uh, he ended up, uh, in exchange for his length of service, uh, was freed mm-hmm. uh, and eventually relocated, I believe, either New Hampshire or Western Massachusetts uh, as a freedman. Uh, most of the slaves, of course, Massachusetts did declare slavery uh, um, illegal and banded at the end of the American mm-hmm. Revolution. So as a result, these enslaved people in uh, Lexington, both men and women, uh, were freed. Most of them uh, relocated to Western Massachusetts or went up into the New Hampshire frontier mm-hmm. and tried to uh, start lives anew up there. It's interesting. So the laws say one thing, they can't train with the militia, right? turn out an alarm, but it sounds like Sometimes two plus two doesn't always equal four. Exactly. It, it wasn't just Lexington. It was across New England uh, as well. And it was one of the comp- complaints that Washington had when he arrived uh, during the siege of Boston and looked out at his New England uh, troops and uh, indicated uh, that a large percentage of them were black uh, enslaved people. Uh, and there is, I've seen some documentation recently and don't quote me on it, but I have seen some documentation that they they suggest that upwards of at least a quarter of the militia ranks, uh, if maybe slightly higher, were uh, enslaved people or, or black people who were mm-hmm. fighting uh, for the American cause on uh, 1775. Certainly a complex picture. Yes, very. Um, so let's talk about Captain Parker for a bit. <clears throat> so, you know, obviously his leadership on that day has been both, you know, lauded, uh, particularly in taking the company back into action in the afternoon, uh, something we today call Parker's Revenge, uh, but also criticized. You know, I think it was Samuel Hartwell, you know, who talked about the company out on the green saying it was too much braving of danger. Um, But what were some of the challenges that he was up against? You know, how is he making these decisions? Well, the first thing you have to understand with John Parker is despite the legend and lore out there, he was not a veteran of the French and Indian War. Um, that was a story that was started by John Parker's granddaughter or great granddaughter in the 1890s. Uh, and it was at that time that supposedly he served, um, during the French and Indian war Mm -hmm. by the 1940s, it had expanded that he was a uh, member uh, of Rogers Rangers, 
Uh, and by 1990, wasn't uh, everybody? Well, of course, I think everybody. I think you and I were. <laughs> so um, by uh, by 1990, it had been expanded uh, to indicate that he was also not only a ranger and a member and fought in the French Indian Wars, but it was also present during the siege of Lewisburg. Hmm. Uh, there's no documentation that he served in either military conflict. If he was present at the siege of Lewisburg, he was a, a young teenager and would have been at best maybe a waiter uh, or an officer's assistant. Uh, but during the French Indian War, he was home, uh, <laughs> I put it bluntly, getting his wife pregnant <laughs> multiple times. So when he should have been at the siege of Quebec, his wife was delivering a child and he was present. Uh, mm -hmm. When he was supposedly uh, present uh, attacking Fort Tigonaroga, he was really in Lexington being issued a bayonet from uh, colony stores. Mm -hmm. So the documentation shows that uh, he was not a, a veteran. Um, that doesn't mean that he didn't take these steps to try and prepare himself uh, for uh, uh, the Reverend uh, Journal does reference that Parker was constantly bor borrowing books from him, including military treatises leading up mm -hmm. to the war. The tough thing about Parker, when you first take a look at the Battle of Lexington, tactically, uh, you're literally standing in the middle of an open field uh, with roads on either side and a military uh, body marching towards you uh, at a, and then deploying into a battle line instantaneously. Right. Um, you know, many people have said it was a silly location. Some people have said, well, first of all, uh, there was a debate. Do they stay at that location? And you have to look at their <clears throat> mindset earlier in the evening, mm -hmm. around midnight of April 19th. Uh, at that time, they were aware that British troops were mobilizing and on the march. There was an initial belief that uh, Samuel Adams and John Hancock were the targets of this operation, not right. conquered. And of course, who is in Lexington at this time? Samuel Adams and John Hancock. They are standing, staying at what is now referred to as the Hancock Clark House, the Reverend Jonas Clark's parsonage. Right. So there was concern that there would be violence in the town. There would be looting in the town. So uh, as a result, that's why they chose to remain in the town. By about four or five in the morning, uh, the Lexington militia is well aware that Adams and Hancock at best are secondary targets. The main objective is mm -hmm. Concord. The only way they're going to be targets is if they stumble across the column. Right. But I still think <clears throat> there was a concern and the company did debate going back and forth um, whether or not they should uh, remain in the area or march mm -hmm. towards Concord. Um, so they ended up staying in Lexington. But the next question is, why did they stay on the green? Why didn't they mm -hmm. take up a position? Uh, perhaps east of the common, down Bedford Road, uh, some location uh, where they could be a safe distance. And I think it's based upon uh, precedence. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, you have the Salem Affair. Uh, the Salem Affair, uh, when British troops uh, landed in Marblehead, marched to Salem, Massachusetts to seize what they believed were uh, to a pair of brass cannons stored there. Uh, they were confronted uh, by uh, Essex County Militia. There was a standoff and uh, the British soldiers were allowed to conduct a quick search and then sent home, but it was for all purposes of defeat uh, for the British. It was a failed operation. There were also accounts where British regiments were going out into the countryside exercising, were just basically going on practice mm -hmm. march routes, uh, where British, uh, excuse me, where, uh, Massachusetts militia would actually appear as observation. Mm -hmm. I think Parker had that in his mind um, as a precedence that we can display on the green as sort of a uh, unit of observation uh, to ensure protection of the town from any mm -hmm. potential looting, but at the same time, perhaps dissuade the British from continuing on to uh, Concord. As we all know, it was a bad decision. <laughs> it, it ended up, you know, with, with uh, multiple casualties on the green and Parker was swept from the field. Um, to his credit, however, I mean, this was a defeated unit uh, where uh, basically my estimates is somewhere almost up to a third of the, of the entire uh, training band was wiped out uh, yeah. in the morning battle. Uh, and it was the highest casualties for the day. Parker could have probably just simply written it off and called it a day and, and evacuated everybody and said, all right, we'll hide, you know, in parts unknown, we'll be safe. But to his credit, uh, within three hours, um, he had um, the Lexington uh, training band completely uh, uh, mobilized. Uh, it's credit to him as well as to Reverend Jonas Clark that they were able to somehow get this entire company together, uh, reform the company, motivate them to go back into battle, even mm -hmm. though they had been swept, and then advance to, uh, to a location that was tactically advantageous for them. 
Now that goes to the second credit was Parker's Revenge, which you reference. Uh, yeah. The great thing about the, your the archaeological review that was done by your park is we now have an understanding uh, of the battlefield at Parker's Revenge. Yeah. And that site was specifically picked by Parker um, because there was a choke point. Similar to Miriam's Corner, there was a mm-hmm. choke point where the British had to cross uh, over a, uh, a narrow stream or brook that was yep. a single bridge. And Parker's company was waiting there in, in ambush. Now, it could have been he did have um, a uh, ensign, uh, Rob, uh, Edmund Monroe, excuse mm-hmm. me. Edmund Monroe was actually a French and Indian War veteran uh, and was a member of a uh, of Rogers Rangers. We do have documentation that he was uh, a member of that company. Mm-hmm. Did he consult John Parker perhaps for that ambush site? Possibly, but it was Parker who set it up and uh, successfully ambushed the uh, the unit on the way back. So when I hear people say to me, well, he was a French and Indian War vet. He was a brilliant military leader. My response usually is, listen, no, he wasn't a French and Indian War vet, but it just goes to show what a natural leader he was to re- you know, reorganize and rally his troops and set up this ambush site at Parker's Revenge and successfully kick the British column in the butt and then successfully withdraw the unit uh, from the uh, from the battlefield with minimal casualties on the second attack uh, goes to his skills. Oh, absolutely. I remember when, you know, they first started to kind of crack the code, you know, with the archaeological investigation and uh, our common friend, Joel Boy, yep. uh, had me meet, meet him out on the battle site and you know, it was just one of those moments where it's like, you know, when I see the ground, we're kind of going over the data and it's like, okay, you, you compare what happened on the town green in the morning in this position, this was all business. I mean, they were out there to do some damage. Yes, they, they absolutely were. When you, when you take a look at the, the ambush site, they, they, they were determined that they were going to cause as much damage as quickly as possible, hit them and get out of there as quickly as possible. Yeah. I mean, even the, the the selection of a bridle path for withdrawal mm-hmm. uh, shows that they were going to do as much as possible to uh, discourage a light infantry pursuit uh, right. further into the woods. And again, it, it goes to Lexington Tribute and, and Captain Parker uh, that they were able to successfully implement the strategy when the British arrived. Yeah, because it's amazing because you do have an escape route. Yes. You know? So it's like they're going to they're gonna hit them, they're going to do some damage, and they're going to get out you know, with minimal loss of life, it's almost like, you know, sort of haunted by what happened in the town green in the morning. That's not going to happen to them twice. Right, right, exactly. Incredible. Um, so uh, last question. So, you know, obviously this, this battle took place amongst a community. Mm-hmm. Uh, it suffered enormous loss of life. How were the non-combatants responding to this? It, it, it was... Uh, it was horrifying is the best way I can describe it. Um, it began uh, around midnight uh, mm-hmm. when uh, riders were coming in saying, listen, there is a British operation coming. Uh, we don't know if it's coming here to Lexington or it's going to Concord, but it is coming. Um, there was an absolute panic that set into the town. Um, Anna Monroe, uh, who was the wife of William Monroe, the tavern owner, mm-hmm. uh, and also sergeant in Parker's company, she recalled how she was baking bread for her husband, crying because she doesn't know when she's going to see her husband again. Families are evacuating uh, out of their homes, abandoning their homes. They're fleeing towards Bedford. They're fleeing towards uh, Woburn. There's an area in Woburn that's referred to, excuse me, an area in Lexington on the Woburn line that's referred to as New Scotland. Uh, It was called New Scotland because there was a lot of Scottish settlers in that location. They were fleeing to those locations. There are accounts um, from Lexington militiamen uh, from the 19th century how they remembered waiting for the British to arrive, and they were either in uh, Buckman Tavern or they were waiting in the abandoned homes uh, for the British to uh, to come. Mm-hmm. So prior to the battle, uh, Lexington, uh, the civilian just emptied out. When the battle ended, Captain Parker's wife, Lydia, sent her uh, teenage son, who I think might have been 13 at the time, so he was too young to fight at the battle, up onto a nearby hill to look down towards the Lexington Green to see what had happened, because she was afraid that the Lexington, were, uh, that the Redcoats were looting and burning the town. And of course, she saw, uh, the, the son saw the, the dead on the green and the wounded on the green, the British uh, marching towards Concord. And that's when families started to come back from hiding and went down to the green. And it was, once again, it was a huge panic because they realized they're going to Concord. It's almost certain they're coming back through this town. Yeah. And it was just second evacuation. Well, the first thing was we go back to the spiritual leader, the Reverend Jonas Clark. 
he actually, despite the fact of the threat of, um, of the uh, British coming back, held a memorial service for those who were killed uh, on the green. Uh, he then instructed them to be buried in a shallow grave, um, uh, and then uh, the graves covered with brush to make it look like a wood pile or a brush pile, because he was afraid that they was going to uh, uh, loot the bodies on the way back. Oh, wow. uh, Clark, to his credit, as well as a few other leaders, organized all the women, all the children, and some of the men, and got them out of the area. And there was this mass evacuation. Of course, it wasn't just Lexington. The evacuation mm-hmm. was taking place all up and down the Boston Road. Um, and they, uh, they evacuated to nearby hills. They evacuated towards uh, Burlington, uh, Bedford. Uh, they evacuated uh, towards Woburn just to get out of the way. And it was just this awful fear and fright. Mm. But some of the people waited to the last minute. Uh, Anna Monroe, who I referenced, after the first uh, evacuation, she went back to her tavern. Uh, and her daughter um, gives a uh, child witness account from the 19th century when she was an adult. And she describes, the only thing I remember from the day is the red coats, the artillery cannons go off, and the house is burning. Oh, my God. Which if, you, if you think about the, the, the impact that had on a five-year-old child that, that happened at the time. That's horrifying. It, it's horrifying. And so when the people came back after the battle, um, East Lexington, uh, which is pretty much from Monroe Tavern heading towards uh, Monotomy, which is now Arlington today, mm-hmm. was absolutely devastated. Uh, all the houses had been burned out or looted. Uh, there was hand-to-hand combat in several of the homes. Mm-hmm. And under 18th century uh, property laws, breaking and entering into a home and looting a home is the same as murder. It's actually a capital offense that you would be executed for. Mm-hmm. Uh, same with robbery. So many, many people. Uh, Lydia Mulliken was the one who had the worst damage of, of all the houses. I believe her home was burnt to the ground, but everything was looted from it as well. Uh, they found their houses destroyed. Uh, they found uh, segments of their homes burnt, uh, property stolen. As Andover militiamen later in the day were marching through the town, uh, they described the, uh, the destruction. A- and they described how they saw, you know, uh, furniture smashed and thrown out into the street, dead cattle, uh, dead farm animals, houses burning, uh, houses that had been looted. Uh, it, it was just a horrifying impact. And this was an impact that stayed with Lexington throughout the war. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it sort of served as the motivator uh, for Lexington to continu- continue sending troops and enlisting troops. Uh, there was an entire company of Lexington men uh, that fought with the 15th Massachusetts. That's mm-hmm. how many recruited uh, for the battle. Sadly, uh, at the Battle of Monmouth, there was what I refer to as the second Lexington. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the height of the battle, uh, there was a direct artillery blast uh, that uh, Monroe's company, which was made of Lexington men, uh, was hit by the artillery blast, and four men from Lexington were killed. Oh. Uh, so it was another high casualty, one of them being Edmund Monroe. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was another recount of tragedy. Um, but throughout the war, Lexington uh, continuously, they were, uh, during the siege of Boston, they were constantly sending food, sending militia to support, making bounty coats, uh, sending clothing to, to men. Uh, during the war effort, they were constantly trying to to support uh, the war effort. And you can see in later sermons from the Reverend Clark and town resolutions, they are constantly trying to, you know, support the war effort because of what happened at the Battle of Lexington. Mm. Lexington in the 19th century sort of went in waves with its memory. Uh, as you uh, had the 50th uh, and the 75th anniversary, there was again a renewed interest uh, mm-hmm. in Lexington's role, particularly in relation to Concord, as we, as we know, who fired the first shot. Uh, by the time of the Civil War, uh, it sort of waned off uh, mm-hmm. until the centennial, where there was this effort to try and reunify the country. Uh, and again, there was an interest uh, in Lexington's role, particularly mm-hmm. since President Grant was coming to visit the country uh, and came, excuse me, visit the town. Uh, so the, uh, there was an organization that was created at that time called the Lexington Minutemen, which is sort of a predecessor of the modern day historical mm-hmm. organization, the Lexington Minutemen. And by 1780, the organization was defunct and there was a lack of interest in the battle. In the 17, uh, between 17, uh, 1880s up to, thank you, yeah, between the 1880s up until about 1920, mm-hmm. there was a discussion what to do with the Lexington Green. Uh, there was discussions of turning it into a ballpark. Uh, there oh was God. actually, yeah, there was actually a discussion about turning it into uh, a National Guard armory. Uh, and I have, yeah, I have seen the drawings where the armory would be placed on the full footprint of the Lexington Green. Oh, 
<laughs> Fortunately, that never happened. By the 1950s, you see a resurgence leading up the bicentennial. Mm-hmm. And fortunately, today, through the efforts of Minuteman National Park, the Lexington Minutemen, uh, and other organizations, we're starting to see once again a, a right. real uh, resurgence, uh, which is a great thing to see uh, because this this incident, and particularly Lexington's role, um, has so much to tell, and we've only scratched the surface. Uh, that you know, it, it's a great story that I love always chatting about. Yeah, and as we approach the 250th, you know, in 2025, you know, it's going to be renewed interest, uh, hopefully, you know, again, and we'll see another, you know, resurgence of preservation and people getting involved in like the Lexington Historical Society or the Minutemen or various reenactment units volunteering at their national parks. I I certainly hope so. Frequently. (laughs) (laughs) I I love, and I'll put a shout out to the park. The park is a absolute wonderful, wonderful organization. Uh, Jim does, does an amazing job. The park does an amazing job. Um, it, it really is a wonderful, wonderful site. My kids literally, although they're no longer involved in reenacting, have literally grown up there. You know, whenever yeah. we do picnics or, or say, hey, let's do something. Let's go to Minuteman National Park. Okay. Uh, so it's one that I know Lexington, myself, uh, Lexington Historical Society, we're, we're really looking forward to working with you guys as the 250th approaches. Well, absolutely. And we, we rely on our volunteers are part of the life of the park. And I would also encourage our readers, like if you ever have questions about Lexington, go to Historical Nerdery. That is <laughs> the blog that, that you run um, that yes. I find a great resource. And I will frequently uh, send links to articles to some of Thank our volunteers you. and staff and, um, and uh, you know, so that we can continue to do our job better. So you're definitely enhancing what we do and we appreciate everything that you do. Well, thank you. I do have one final question for you though. Yes. Okay. So your, um, your musical tastes are well known amongst uh, our community. (laughs) Yes, they are. (laughs) And um, so I have to ask of all the guitarists to have played with the band white snake, (laughs) who do you think is, is the best? That was a tough one. Um, I, you know, I, I, I went back and forth, but I'm, I'm going to go with uh, Steve Vai. Uh, Vivian Campbell was one of my choices. Uh, I know we had talked about John Sykes. Mm. Um, but, but growing up in the 80s with my legendary, we'll call it, taste in music, <laughs> uh, Steve Vai was just sort of, sort of part of that, that influence. So, so definitely, even though he wasn't on uh, the, the classic and highly respected self-entitled album White Snake. Um, he, I, I've always felt he was a very talented guitarist, and, and, and so Steve Vai uh, would be my choice. Okay, good answer. I, I, <laughs> I would have thought John Sykes, but... Okay, <laughs> he's he's def, definitely in my top three. Definitely okay. in my top three of White Snake guitarists. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you, Alex. And right, Tim, uh, thank you. you know, again, uh, listeners, you know, if you have questions, go to Historical Nerdery. There's a lot of great articles there written by Alex Kane and... Uh, and, um, yeah, well, well, I guess a uh, happy virtual Patriots Day. Same to you, sir. All right. Take care. Thank you. Right.